Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we're joined by Dale Reinecke, who is currently the VP of Sales Operational Excellence, uh, I hope I got that, that right, um, at Emerson. Now, Dale has significant experience in sales and sales management. I think we're looking at about 16 years pre-moving in to the operational side or the sales ops side. And so that's what I'm looking forward to getting Dale's opinion on uh, in this episode. So, Dale, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ken. Looking forward to it. <laughs> and so, first question, sure. extensive experience in sales and sales operations. What kind of drove you towards moving into the, the operational side? Yeah, so, so first, just to clarify, I, I am no longer employed at Emerson. I'm uh, uh, looking for a new opportunity, but I my last role was as the vice president of sales operational excellence. So I just want to be clear on that point. But uh, I, I started my career as a customer facing, actually, as, originally as a field service engineer, and then got into a successful bag carrying sales role. Um, and just continued to move up through the organization. I, I then became a manager of uh, direct salespeople and was responsible for hiring, training, developing salespeople. And that led into a, uh, a promotion where I was responsible for sales managers. So then I had area managers, regional managers, and I managed uh, – about a half a million dollars worth of uh, sales business for multiple business units uh, while I was at Emerson um, and kind of backed into the sales operational role. Uh, uh, we needed somebody to step in and continue to drive sales excellence. And uh, uh, I was asked to participate in trying to find somebody. And uh, after a while, I just pretty much said, I'm your guy. I think I can. I can do this. <laughs> um, let me let me take a run at it, and and uh, then I became the vice president of sales operational excellence for the North America organization that Emerson has. Uh, that was about six billion dollars of of sales um, across multiple businesses, multiple go to market strategies, um, and. My role, I think, was fairly broad when it comes to what sales operations is about. It wasn't just, uh, you know, driving CRM and, and uh, developing strategies and territories that had everything to do with uh, working with HR in terms of talent acquisition. Um, I had a learning and development group that was part of my team. And we worked very closely with uh, account management and, and our projects team. So very broad sales operational responsibilities in, in that uh, role that I had at Emerson. Awesome. And then apologies for getting the current role uh, wrong. Um, I have a quick question about the back history. At what point during the selling career did you lose your own quota and were there, therefore focused the majority of the time on the people you were managing? Uh, you know, as, as a, when I became a regional manager, I had a regional quota that, that I divided up among salespeople. And then as I became an area vice president, it was a bigger quota that had to get divvied up. Um, once I stepped into the operational excellence role, my compensation, my bonus was no longer based on, you know, how North America did, at least, at least not, in, not specifically. Uh, so that would be the first time that I really, over my whole career, didn't have a particular number that I was trying to hit. Awesome. And now going, going back to the time at, at Emerson, how many sales reps were you impacting in that role of, of the sales operational excellence? Well, you know, um, my role was a North America focused role with the responsibility of working with the other world areas and driving a global standard across all the world, the world areas for processes, technology, sales methodology, uh, and, and we had over, you know, I don't, I'm not sure we ever knew the exact number, but, you know, several thousand salespeople, certainly in North America, we had more than a thousand salespeople, customer facing people uh, from the various uh, go to market channels, whether it was direct salespeople, employees of Emerson, 
uh, working for our loyal business partners or, you know, just, just general distributors. And how many people were there in your, your central team that were tasked with making these people more productive? It was a relatively small team. Uh, we had a, uh, a group of people focused on um, CRM and some of the digital tools that we were using to try to you know, internally transform our, our sales organization. We had a uh, learning and development group that was just a very small group. Um, we worked very closely with, with the HR organization in terms of developing sales personas and looking at compensation plans, things like that, but they were really not a part of my direct team. So a relatively small group of people, five or six people total. Got it. Can you share those digital tools that you, that you mentioned that you were using to help boost productivity? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, Emerson is very much a Oracle house. Um, they use Oracle for their ERP system and, uh, uh, you know, we were in the process of moving from Oracle CRM on demand to sales cloud by Oracle um, for our CRM platform. We worked very closely with the marketing side to uh, make sure from a leads and opportunity standpoint, Eloqua was very tightly integrated with, uh, with sales cloud. Um, our sales methodology was developed working with uh, Sales Performance International, SBI, um, using their solution selling methodology. And we developed some internal sales tools that integrated with uh, Sales Cloud as well to you know, help make sure that salespeople could move projects and pieces of business through the various sales stages. Got it. And was there like one specific thing that you can remember that really had an impact on how much the reps were able to sell. So something that your central team implemented. I, I, we have a long history with, uh, Emerson had a long history with uh, solution selling and SBI, but when I came on, we, we really wanted to reinvigorate the sales force. And we went through a process of, uh, um, through some remote training, some online training and face-to-face -face workshops trained, uh, well over two or 3,000 salespeople. And I think it's really important. Uh, you know, one of the things that's, that, that I've learned is you have to have a sales methodology. You have to have a process. It, it creates a common language. It creates uh, the way you communicate. It uh, helps to bring people up to speed faster when you're going through an onboarding process. So I would say driving a consistent global sales methodology uh, was one of the things that that will have a you know huge productivity impact on the entire selling organization. All right. And just for the benefit of the audience, can you briefly summarize the whole solution selling methodology that you guys trained in? Yeah, we you know um, SPI, they're a great partner of Emerson's. Uh, they their solution selling process looks at the customers' buying behaviors, which obviously in the last you know, two years has dramatically changed and is continuing to transition. Um, you know, typically customers now do a lot of research online. They understand what they want to buy even before they reach out to salespeople. So it's critical that salespeople understand how to have an impact right away. But solution selling tries to line up uh, your buying processes with the customer's buying behaviors. And, and so, you, you know, the, the, the challenge is, as a seller is to identify where, where your customer is at in the, the buying process, align with them and understand their pain, uh, make sure you're at the right level of, you know, the, the formula that SBI uses is pain, power, value, vision, control um, and collaboration. So you're working through various stages with your clients to um, understand what their issues are, make sure you, you're at the power that can make decisions and uh, then help make sure your products, your solutions fit their vision or if, if need be, uh, try to re-engineer their vision if uh, you think you have a, a better better fit. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. 
And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Cool. Um, I assume during your time there, you probably did some work on the forecasting process. Could you share like roughly what that process was and any changes you made, if any, that improved accuracy? I mean, you know, forecast is uh, near and dear to my heart. That's for sure. I mean, as a sales manager, we had to do forecasts for a very long time and, you know, got beat up beside the head if we weren't doing a, a good job. And, and uh, when we were doing well, it was, you know, things were good. I think one thing that's interesting from my perspective, forecasting is a very easy and simple process when you're in a stable environment. You know, when you can understand what your MRO typically is and you can look at data to help you figure it out, uh, you know, forecasting can be, you know, a pretty simple process. The problem is when things start to move around, which I, which we're in a, you know, very uh, interesting place right now. You know, when, when things are going down and you don't know how fast they're going down or when things start to come back and you don't know how fast they're coming back, you know, forecasting your business is, is way more important, but it's very hard to do. Um, I think uh, the, the forecasting experience that I'm familiar with starts with uh, looking at your historical business and how much growth the corporation expects to, to get. Uh, usually, you want to grow faster than the market, so you're taking market share. Um, and it starts at a real high, you know, top-down sort of level. But when it gets to a month to month or a quarterly forecast, you got to dig in with the salespeople and help them understand how their business is, is moving. And again, the sales methodology is about moving projects and pieces of business through the sales pipeline. You have to, you know, as a sales manager, the best thing you can do is, is uh, move those projects and pieces of business as fast as you can through the, the pipeline that the salesperson is managing. So, um, you know, rolling up from the bottom up that monthly quarterly forecast uh, is, is the, uh, it's really important to help the business, the higher level business make the right decisions. Uh, it's got to be extremely difficult right now for many organizations to try to figure out what that looks like. I mean, you got projects that are being delayed, put on hold. You've got, you know, certain businesses that that uh, because of the COVID nineteen epidemic uh, um, are are having great opportunities to grow as fast as they possibly can. But how do you hire? How do you train people? How do you bring them up to speed when? You can't bring them face to face and and uh, even do interviews sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Do, do you think? Do you think that's the biggest impact the virus is having on sales right now? The the inability to meet face to face with clients, but also to meet face to face with your team to onboard and train. Or do you think there's some other hidden effect that is is hindering the ability to sell? I, I do think that we were in the process of uh, because our clients' buying behaviors were changing, that the sales, uh, the transformation of sales was taking place prior to all this. I think this uh, is accelerating that. Um, salespeople, outside salespeople, customer facing salespeople, I'm, I'm sure are gaining a, a big appreciation for what their inside counterparts have been doing because. The outside selling job today is is a lot more like an inside selling job where you've got to uh, be able to communicate effectively through a Zoom meeting. Uh, you've got to be able to bring in experts and you know subject matter experts as part of a, a virtual meeting. So uh, I, I think it's a big challenge to onboard people. You know, typically in in my experience. Onboarding means you take them to the factory and you sit them down and give them some product training. Well, those things are a lot harder to do today. So how do you how do you do it more remotely? How do you do it online? How do you do self paced? And uh, you know how how do you train salespeople to effectively conduct a sales call remotely? Is I think uh, 
a, a new skill that uh, is is a is a very important one. Sure. Moving on to sales metrics, if you could only measure one more sales metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Wow, that's a great question. I probably won't be able to give you one because, um, because you know, I think uh, as a selling organization, you ultimately have to, uh, you know, prove your ROI, your return on investment, to your upper management, to the shareholders and the investors of the corporation. Um, but my experience tells me to effectively uh, measure sales performance, you have to look at, at how you can measure the behaviors that you're trying to drive. You're trying to drive more customer engagement, higher level customer engagement. You want to make sure that your sales managers are uh, uh, doing effective coaching sessions. So. I, I'm a believer that you have to look at those individual measurements of, you know, how do you, how do you, how many times are your coaches, your sales managers coaching their salespeople? How many times are they doing opportunity reviews with, uh, with their salespeople? You can look at CRM in terms of number of opportunities, dollars of opportunities and things like that. But really, again, you got to try to look at how do you move stuff through the, the sales pipeline. And you got to go back and look at those individual behaviors that you're trying to drive. And, you know, ultimately, they hopefully prove to the organization that uh, you're increasing sales productivity, you're bringing the cost of sales down, those bigger, higher, more important measures that our executives want to look at. But it's got to start with those baseline behaviors. And then final question, uh, who in the world of sales operations has influenced you the most? Uh, you know, my career started from the ground up, customer facing jobs. So I, I think over the years, I've had the pleasure to work with a lot of progressive salespeople that, that use digital tools, you know, 15, 20 years ago to try to understand their business, get their arms around who their customers were, do some, some customer segmentation, um, one of my sales peers, Jeff Greenland, is a, a guy that I would mention. And then I, I've also had lots of great managers over the years that coached me. Um, Steve Kins, Randy Schrader, John Gardner is another guy. And, and I got to give a lot of kudos to SPI, Sales Performance International. Uh, uh, they helped. They work very closely with, with Emerson to help us set directions, understand where we want to go. And uh, their team is, uh, they got some great people. Keith Eads was the founder of uh, Solution Selling. He's, I think, since retired from SPI, but uh, um, he, he's a pretty sharp guy. Amazing. Many, many influences. I, I definitely am going to look into SPI more um, and Solution Selling. Maybe we can even get someone from there on the show. Um, awesome. Dale, so here are the three things that I picked out. We look for like one quote from the episode, and I think the quote here is going to be the the importance of having a consistent sales methodology. I think if a sales organization doesn't have that, there's probably a lot of benefits, a lot of efficiencies in onboarding, for example, that you can gain from that. You, you, your quite simple point about how the the, the sales operation, you know, so sales reps and management, need to justify their expense to the business, right? And, and so it, a large part of metrics are proving that you are worth the money that they're spending on commission and salaries. And then finally, you're, I think this is the first time you've had uh, such internal performance metrics given for that question, such as, uh, and not just focused on the rep activities, but focused on the manager activities, which is super interesting, right? And, and so if, okay. if the sales managers are doing these things, then in theory, revenue down the line is going to increase. Um, I, I, you know, I think when you... Talk about onboarding and, and things like that. Uh, my opinion, the role of the frontline sales managers is so important to developing salespeople, to helping them move stuff through their pipeline. Uh, uh, frontline sales managers are a, a critical part of the organization, and uh, you can't you can't put enough time and focus in developing that layer of your sales management. Sure. Dale, um, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you.
yeah, please uh, let me know if I can be of any other help. Yeah, so, so we will definitely link below to to your LinkedIn profile if someone is looking for some okay. of your of your capabilities. Um, Dale, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.